Okay, we're just giving time for people to join. Good morning, everyone, and those of you who are joining now. We'll just give it a minute or two more before we get started. Okay, I think we'll get ahead because we have a lot to cover today. So good morning, good afternoon and a good evening to our panelists and also to our participants and those of you who joined us on our previous webinar from across the globe. And I'd like to thank the, those of you who were part of the Instagram Live who have just uh, moved over to join us here for the uh, hour and a half long uh, webinar. So on behalf of the Programme in Global Surgery and Social Change, I'd like to thank uh, our supporting hosts, the Africa CDC, World Orthopaedic UK, Brigham and Women's Mass General uh, Brigham, and the Gillian Rennie Stepping Strong Foundation. Uh, thank you all for supporting this really important and timely webinar, given it is two days uh, after World Health um, uh, Mental Health Day. So this webinar really will be focusing on the mental health component to sustaining a trauma injury. Typically when we see a physical uh, wound or an injury that has occurred, our focus tends to be on that rather than the actual other sequelae that occur during the time of sustaining an injury. We'd like to really draw on the practical tools that uh, one should adopt as an individual, but also as a, a provider. We want to understand more about what it means to uh, suffer with mental health and also to actually um, grow from it as well. Here are some topics that we will discuss uh, through this webinar, but first off, we'll start off with this framing uh, talk just to really give you a sense of what we are trying to achieve over the next hour and a half. So we'll talk a little bit about the webinar series, uh, what the trauma burden is, what our learning objectives are, the topics that we'll cover and who our panelists are today. So in May, we had our road traffic injury uh, webinar which went incredibly well. We spoke about the different components of a trauma system from prevention to definitive trauma care. It was a really insightful webinar, which drew a, a wide audience varying from providers to, to patients um, and just a lay audience. We really wanted to listen to those who attended and some of the, the asks were for us to speak on two specific other topics, one being mental health and the other being uh, gun violence. So we wanted to really understand a little bit more about uh, the ask and how we should frame the setting, the, the webinar for today. Partly we had people sharing what their symptoms were and this really allowed us to think about uh, developing this three part series and what this essential uh, webinar would be like today. So in terms of what we hope to understand uh, through actually running this webinar today is for people to understand that trauma is really a public health uh, crisis. It affects us uh, predominantly across the, um, the globe, but mainly in low to middle income countries. And we know that 90% of the deaths that occur due to trauma occur in this region. And 96% of the morbidities also occur in this region as well. The number of people who end up with injuries that are non-fatal has been defined as around 20 to 50 million people per year. The manifestations of this, as we know, can be physical, but there also can be mental and other consequences can be uh, catastrophic uh, financial. Our job as providers, policymakers, even researchers, is to try and mitigate these um, secondary uh, effects and to recognize what they are and offer timely treatment. 
focusing on mental health. We think about the patient, but we also need to think about the provider as well in this setting. So our learning objectives for today are three. One is to try and inform our audience on the complexities of mental health in relation to sustaining a traumatic injury. We will attempt to introduce what the trauma-informed care model is and in the context of the survivor and also healthcare provider and also offer some practical tools in the firm of psycho psychological first aid uh, to try and address some of these mental health challenges that may occur and how this actually intersects with uh, physical uh, injury. So first off, we'll hear from uh, Jessica Mondelo, who is a trauma survivor from the first Haiti earthquake in 2010. Uh, Jessica is a uh, law student. Uh, she is also a, um, has a degree in hotelier and uh, tourism um, management and has her own uh, company. She's a CEO of JM Unlimited. She will talk on her journey as a trauma survivor, the events that she experienced, the symptoms that she had uh, and how she's managed to overcome. Professor Surya Sadat will talk on the mental health uh, sequelae of traumatic injuries. Dr Sadat is a uh, distinguished professor of psychiatry and executive head of the Department of Psychiatry at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town in South Africa. She also holds a South Africa Research Chair in the Post Traumatic Stress Disorders and is a director of the South Africa Medical Research Council unit um, on the genomic of brain injuries. And she has over 20 years experience of clinical and uh, research experience in the field of traumatic stress and anxiety. Dr. Nomi uh, levy Kerrick is an assistant professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and specializes in psychiatric consultation in medical settings and developing programs to bring a trauma-informed perspective across uh, care domains. She's also the Associate Vice Chair of the Ambulatory Service at the Brigham Health and Co-Chair of the Mass General Brigham Trauma-Informed Care Initiative. Dr. Uh, levy Kerrick will speak on the actual approach, uh, trauma-informed care model, uh, to survivors of physical injury, the what, the why, and the how. And Nadia Ramond uh, will speak on the six principles of trauma-informed care. So Nadia Ramond is a regional nurse director at the Southern Jamaica Plain Brigham and Women's Hospital, a community health centre that delivers care to more than 10,000 patients in the surrounding community. Uh, Nadia is a PhD candidate and has an extensive experience in global health uh, nursing and uh, critical care nursing. Nadia is uh, integral in the Haiti earthquake response from a psychological perspective. Dr. Jaren Arkutuk is an associate professor in clinical psychology in the Department of Psychology at Koch University in Turkey. Uh, she received her PhD in clinical uh, psychology from uh, Fergie University and was a postdoctoral fellow in the social medicine at the Faculty of Medicine in University of Amsterdam. Her work focuses on prevention and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders and other common mental disorders resulting from trauma and adversaries. And her experience is mainly working with Syrian uh, refugees in Turkey. And she's currently studying the implementation of scalable psychosocial interventions developed by the WHO among refugees. We will hear from Dr. Arkutuk on the psychological first aid, the whom, the when, and where to provide the FA. And then we'll hear about the tools required. Dr. Benjamin Kunu will speak on the tools versus no tools in the psychological care delivery, specifically in uh, Togo. Benjamin Kunu is an assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Applied Psych Psychology from the University of Lome, Togo. He's also the director of the Centre of Psychotraumatology and Brief Therapies in Togo, and he has his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Paul Sabatier in Toulouse, uh, France. And finally, we'll hear from our um, co-moderator, uh, Professor Eric Bui, who's a PhD in, in psychiatry, a professor of psychiatry at the University of Kent Normandy, and an adjunct investigator at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. Um, and he serves in different leadership roles in his capacity as Harvard Medical School faculty, and has been for the, for the past 10 years. 
His specialist area include treatment of anxiety, stress-related conditions, and which include PTSD and complicated uh, grief. And he is the current president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and associate editor of the European Journal of Psychotraumatology and an editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Mental Health. Um, I welcome you all. And now we will start with the panelists' uh, Talks. I hope you all enjoy this session. My name is Jessica Mondelus. I'm 26 years old. I'm a survivor of the earthquake of January 12, 2010 in Haiti. I'm going to share my experience during and after the earthquake. The earthquake happened while I was home. I was 15 years old. I don't remember what happened, but I had found myself on the hospital ground and my family found me days later on Friday 15. That date is also my mother's birthday. During my hospitalization, the doctor had to remove my left ear. I didn't realize they would be able to reconstruct it later. I didn't know what was happening. All I understood was they had to remove my left ear. Six months and four surgeries later, I had to go back to school. I had to try to have a normal life knowing it would never be the same again. And some days, it was so difficult to attend school as I was teased, bullied by the other classmates, and even people close to me in my family were teasing, were calling me names, half here, which means Budzale in Haitian Creole. Life wasn't easy being judged by society I often thought about what had happened to me. I couldn't sleep or eat anymore. I had nightmares. In 2011, my mother tried to get me to therapy, but I had to stop after only three sessions as she could not afford it. I spent many years from 2010 to 2018 wearing wigs or scarves to hide the major scars on my forehead, my scalp, and my left ear. For me, head wrapping is an art, and whenever I would not be inspired to create a new style, in those moments, I would throw a tantrum, crying, hitting my head on the walls, wishing that God should have killed me instead of saving me. Because I wore so many head wraps and head scarves, I decided to create a head wrap and head scarf business called BUTV in 2015. Selling the scarf and then putting the profit toward charitable events was also a way for me to give back to the community. And this action helped me during my journey. I have missed many opportunities in my life because of my scars and deformity. The judgment of society led me to not accept myself. My first ear reconstruction surgery was in 2017, but after three months, the reconstruction failed and my ear was back to how it was. I was really anticipating my life would change after surgery. I was no longer socializing. People would say all kind of things to destabilize me. For example, that I got my ear cut because I'm a thief. And let me tell you, it worked because I lost my identity. I couldn't remember who I was. In 2018, I had my second procedure, but this time, my family explicitly said 
they wouldn't stand by my side because they were scared that it would be fatal that I could die. I decided to do it anyway, and fortunately, I had my friend Taphne who supported me through the whole process. And the surgery was a success. A few months post-surgery, I was graduating college where I studied hotel and tourism management. It was the first time that I was going to show my scars in public without trying to hide them under a scarf. I had a haircut, which I thought was beautiful, but I still wondered what people would think of me. People started asking questions about when and where I got into this accident. I remember that I was crying while walking down the aisle. But when I laid eyes on my mother, seeing her reminded me of the support she has given me, the strength in me, how much she loves me, and how often she tells me that I'm pretty anyway. On my graduation day, I decided to accept myself and show my scars and kept on doing it over and over again. This is when I finally realized that it was never about what people would think of me. I was the problem. I couldn't accept myself, so people would never accept me either. As you can see here, my ear looks almost normal. I have now spent years not wearing head tie. It was hard at first, but now I feel pretty. It wasn't easy, but I learned to love myself. I have to say the doctors play a big part in my healing process, sometimes playing the role of psychologist. I wasn't assisted by a formal psychologist. I believe that if I had been able to find psychological help from the beginning, it would have been less difficult. My mother couldn't afford one or I couldn't find one for free. From 2010 to 2018, I spent eight years hiding my true self and my emotions. I initiated a whole social media campaign on self-love. But the truth is, I didn't feel this way about myself. It was not easy, but I had to learn to love myself again with the help of those close to me. I also read motivational books. I meditated and I tried to help myself by helping others so I can move forward with my life. I always tell people my story because I want to inspire others. It was, it was not easy to overcome the trauma, but I can now say that I'm recovered. Now, when people comment about my scars, it does not bother me. Now, I even joke about my own scars saying, oh, look at the Nike logo near my ear. There are many more details to my story. I hope one day I will be able to write it down for others to understand. Because I want to encourage other survivors to keep fighting and to accept themselves. This is a way to protect your mental health. This experience changed my life. I am someone else now. I want to continue to inspire other people who have had similar experiences. To the survivors, learn to accept yourself first and the people who start accepting you for who you are. Thank you for this opportunity to share my journey with you all. Thank you, Jessica. And as quite rightly said in the chat, that was very um, moving and uh, touching. Thank you for being so honest and open with your story. Um, and that was narrated by uh, Tyana uh, Jean-Pierre, who's one of our uh, PGSSC uh, fellows, uh, RAs. Thank you very much for doing so. Okay, so next we'll hear from uh, Dr. Soraya uh, Sadat, who will give us the talk on the mental health. Uh, 
So clearly, thank you. Greetings and uh, thank you for the invitation to be a panelist. Um, as Michelle has indicated in uh, her introductory statement, uh, trauma constitutes a major public health burden. Uh, apologies, I'm just struggling to advance my slides. Um, so it constitutes a major public health burden. Um, and when we think about um, trauma, um, we think about events that are life-threatening, uh, that cause serious injury, uh, or cause a threat to the physical integrity of an individual. In the context of this talk, um, trauma uh, encompasses physical injuries, all types of injury, both intentional as well as unintentional, um, and includes traumatic brain injuries. Now, traumatic brain injuries typically occur from a blow or jolt to the head, that may occur in an accident, blast, or fall. Often people refer to traumatic brain injuries uh, by referring to the symptoms that occur following a traumatic brain injury. Actually, a TBI is the injury itself, not the symptoms. And a TBI is basically the same thing as a concussion in lay terms. So why is trauma a major public health burden? Uh, well, trauma admissions to emergency departments and casualty units are often the first point of care for survivors at risk for mental health problems. Um, and traumatic injuries result in serious uh, physical and mental health sequelae. Um, and this is a common occurrence. Um, so on the left-hand side of the slide, you see a call for action uh, by the International Academy uh, Partnership, uh, which is the conglomeration of more than 140 national, regional, and global member academies uh, that together um, support a vital role of science in seeking evidence-based uh, solutions to the world's most challenging problems. And I was fortunate in 2018 to serve on the IEP for Health where we put out a call for action, asking that trauma be considered uh, as a disease. Now, when we think about the consequences of trauma, I think it's important to think about trauma in the context of uh, what I would refer to as the three E's, where E um, refers to, uh, firstly, the event. Um, and as I've mentioned, that is the actual extreme threat of physical or psychological harm. And, Often these events are not single occurrences, they are repeated occurrences um, over time. The second E is the experience, um, and this is the effect um, that uh, the event has um, on an individual. Now, in some situations, the individual may not recognize uh, the exposure to trauma as being traumatic. So how an individual labels or assigns meaning uh, to or is impacted by the physical or psychological effects on, of an event will contribute to whether or not uh, they experience the event as traumatic. The effect is what I'm going to focus on today. And this, in the main, refers to the long lasting adverse effects of an event. And this is a critical component when we think about trauma because the adverse effects may not always be immediate. They may be delayed in onset. Um, and in addition to the more visible effects that we may see as clinicians or as family members of an affected individual, there may be an alteration of one's neurobiological makeup um, with ongoing impacts um, on that person's health and well-being. So stress following physical injury in and of itself is not maladaptive, but there's a physical cost to the stress response. And when it becomes chronic, it can result in wear and tear to bodily symptoms, something that we refer to as allostatic load. Now, when an individual has been exposed to um, a traumatic event, there may be a range of symptoms that are experienced, and these are commonly experienced uh, by most of us um, following experience to trauma. When those events are persistent and long lasting, and when they contribute to functional impairment um, and recovery and um, have an influence on 
quality of life, they may become pathological. And that's when we refer to some of the mental health conditions or common mental disorders um, that follow traumatic injuries. Um, and these are commonly uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression or major depressive disorder, range of anxiety disorders, um, complicated bereavement, um, a more correctly known as persistent bereavement disorder, uh, but there may be a host of other conditions that may result from trauma, including uh, substance use disorders, both alcohol and drug use disorders, um, as well as eating disorders. Um, so the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder is variable across the globe. And you will see on the slide on the left-hand side um, that the 12-month prevalence varies by country. Um, and this is a mix um, of high, middle, and low-income countries uh, depicted here. Now, PTSD is the most common psychopathological consequence of traumatic injuries, and that is what I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk today. The differences in prevalence by country may reflect true differences, uh, but they may also reflect other differences, such as underreporting by region, uh, cultural willingness to disclose trauma. We know there are wide ranging differences culturally. There may also be cultural differences in labeling and experience um, as violent, unwanted, or traumatic. Now, several decades of research has led to a number of important conclusions about the nature of potentially traumatic events. And I want you to, um, for a moment, look at the slide on the right. You will see that many people experience um, at least one of these traumas um, over the course of their lifespan. Um, so most people, in fact, experience traumatic events. And if you look at exposure internationally, about 80% of individuals um, across the globe would have been uh, exposed to at least one traumatic event um, in their lifetime. Now, that may be physical injury, but it may also be a non-physical trauma. So most individuals do not develop enduring mental health symptoms following trauma. And I think this is really important to bear in mind that most individuals exposed to trauma to not develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And I want um, to um, take a step sidewards and think about some of the typical symptom trajectories that occur in the aftermath of injury. So as I said, the majority of individuals will be resilient uh, following trauma. And in fact, this group constitutes about 35, between 35 to 65% of all trauma exposed individuals. A small percentage of individuals will develop chronic symptoms, so they will have a chronic trajectory, and this constitutes up to a third of individuals, between 5 to 35 percent. Um, the most common outcome, as I've said, is the resilience uh, trajectory, but in between, we also have a group of individuals who will recover completely. Um, and so these individuals will have a gradual uh, return uh, to pre-morbid functioning, uh, so to their functioning uh, preceding the injury. A much smaller group of individuals will have a delayed onset of symptoms. So they may um, function uh, pretty normally following exposure to the trauma, uh, but uh, some weeks or months after exposure may begin to uh, develop a dysfunctional uh, behaviors and emotional symptoms. Um, so this is uh, showing uh, what I've just described in a different way, as you will see that uh, the vast majority will display um, some symptoms of post-traumatic stress, uh, what we typically refer to as acute stress symptoms in the immediate aftermath of trauma, um, but the vast majority will have a resolution of symptoms um, with approximately a third developing chronic PTSD. So those individuals who continue to manifest symptoms one month after exposure to trauma, of those individuals, about a third who meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder will have chronic symptoms. And this is why, even though there is this paradox between trauma exposure and those who develop PTSD, it is particularly important um, as clinicians that we focus on this group. 
because essentially we want to prevent this trajectory in as much as we can. Um, so then I just want to highlight the um, diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. As I said, um, following traumatic exposure, individuals may display uh, symptoms of acute stress. Now, one in four people will meet criteria for acute stress disorder um, in the uh, intervening period following exposure to trauma and up to one month post-trauma. Those individuals who meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, and that includes a number of symptom criteria, which I will highlight now, um, and have a persistence of those symptoms for more than one month, as well as experience subjective distress and or impairment in a number of domains of functioning, such as in their personal relationships, um, in terms of their work functioning, in their social interactions, may meet criteria for PTSD, and they would be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder should they present for treatment. Post-traumatic stress disorder, as I said, can become chronic. So when we look specifically at adults who've been exposed to a physical injury, at one to six months post-injury, one in five people to one in three people will develop PTSD. So one in five at one month and one in three um, at six months. So in making a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, a clinician will look at a number of symptom domains, uh, what we commonly refer to as symptom clusters, um, that typify or prototypical of post-traumatic stress disorder. They include um, re-experiencing symptoms such as nightmares and flashbacks of the traumatic event, um, avoidance uh, behaviors such as avoiding places, activities, uh, conversations and thoughts related uh, to the trauma, negative alterations in an individual's uh, cognitive and mood state, um, having difficulty experiencing positive feelings directly as a result of the trauma, losing interest in activities an individual previously enjoyed, feeling disconnected from individuals, especially those who haven't experienced the same trauma, um, excessive blame um, of oneself or on others who may have been part and parcel of uh, that trauma exposure, um, having difficulties with uh, memory, um, particularly memory related to the traumatic experience. And then another uh, cluster of symptoms, which are often sort of more evident to family members and colleagues, are the hyperarousal symptom clusters, where individuals may be very jumpy, they're easily startled, they have difficulty concentrating, they tend to be hypervigilant, they constantly scan the environment because they feel unsafe, uh, they often catastrophize uh, their traumatic experience, um, and so um, that fear becomes generalized. Uh, to other contexts that they associate with the traumatic experience. In addition, individuals may have a number of physical symptoms, and this is where it may be difficult to pass out a mental health problem like post-traumatic stress disorder from physical complaints that may be associated with the physical injury. You know, these typically include um, symptoms of um, autonomic uh, hyperarousal, the sympathetic nervous system going into overdrive. Um, and then, uh, very importantly, individuals have experienced um, a life-threatening traumatic event may also start to engage in risky or impulsive behaviors. They may use alcohol or drugs uh, to self-medicate, to numb their symptoms, to um, start to feel normal again. Um, and this can become um, dysfunctional over time. So when we think about this paradox between um, the, um, the pervasive experience of trauma um, in communities around the world um, and the relatively low prevalence of PTSD uh, to exposure, I think it's important to think about um, the etiological factors that come into play. So what are the uh, risk and protective factors? So as you will see here, there are a conglomeration of factors and the factors that are represented here, um, and they're mostly risk factors, 
um, are factors that have been consistently documented in many, many research studies that have followed up individuals early after trauma, particularly physical injuries such as motor vehicle accidents, but other types of physical injury over time, and have examined um, individuals who develop post-traumatic stress disorder and compared them to those who tend to be resilient and who don't develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so, a woman um, and females in general tend to have at least a twofold higher risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder following trauma exposure. And there are a number of reasons um, that we think this may be um, so, uh, but there are a number of other factors. And I just want to highlight a protective factor um, that uh, is represented here, and that is social support. So social support early after trauma is a very potent a protective factor for post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to mention in the context of physical injury, a risk factor for post-traumatic stress disorder, but also other adverse mental health outcomes, and one that can be attended to, especially in emergency casualty units or during acute admissions following injury, and that is persistent pain and other physical health problems uh, that may directly emanate from the injury. So in rounding up my talk, um, I want to say that there are a number of uh, trauma-specific interventions. Um, and I also want to differentiate trauma-specific interventions from trauma-informed approaches to care, which will be covered by another panelist today. Um, so when I uh, speak of trauma-specific interventions, I'm referring to those interventions that have been shown to be safe and effective both early after trauma, but also in individuals who have developed post-traumatic stress disorder and may have chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. So with regards to early interventions, and these are interventions uh, that can be uh, applied within several weeks of the trauma to within um, the first month of trauma, um, early cognitive behavioral interventions have been shown to significantly reduce uh, the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder. They can also reduce the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder in those who may have um, acute stress disorder, but who don't yet meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. In adults who have um, already developed post-traumatic stress disorder, there are a number of first-line treatments. So first-line treatments refer to the uh, treatments that have the best evidence for both um, efficacy um, as well as tolerability. And the psychological therapies that we um, apply in individuals uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, adults specifically, are cognitive behavior therapy that has a trauma focus and other um, types of cognitive and behavioral interventions that have also been shown to be very effective um, include cognitive processing therapy, cognitive therapy, um, EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing and prolonged exposure. Uh, there are also pharmacological therapies that can be administered um, in individuals who have post-traumatic stress disorder that have also been shown to be very safe and effective. And the first line medication therapies are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. I want to end off by saying that any intervention that is administered to an adult with post-traumatic stress disorder needs to be embedded within a, a trauma-informed approach. I also want to say that um, many of these interventions are not necessarily available in low and middle income countries, as has been pointed out, there is um, a large treatment gap, in fact 90% of individuals with common mental disorders in low and middle income countries don't have access to these treatments, but these treatments have been shown to be effectively delivered by non specialist uh, providers so um, it's. These may be nurses um, or community health workers who are not psychiatrists or clinical psychologists. And they can deliver the interventions through task sharing and through close supervision. 
And in fact, non-specialist providers have been shown to be far more effective than just um, the administration of usual care in these settings. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jack, for giving uh, a highly informative uh, talk. Um, you really did uh, bridge very nicely to the trauma-informed care, but also gave us details for both high income and the low income uh, setting as well. Uh, thank you. Okay, so now we'll move on to Dr. Nomi uh, Levick-Kerrick. You should be able to share screen. Thank you. Hi, lovely to be here. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sidat, for that uh, comprehensive uh, view of, of both trauma and uh, trauma-focused care, which uh, uh, we hope to complement uh, in the next few minutes. So a trauma-informed approach to survivors of physical injury. We wanna talk a little bit about the what, the how, uh, and the why here. Um, a trauma-informed approach really realizes the widespread impact of trauma and that there are paths for, uh, for recovery. As uh, Dr. Sadat mentioned, sort of 80% of people uh, around the world will have had exposures to at least uh, one adverse uh, event and, and usually to more. Um, and we know that there's actually a dose response relationship even between the number of childhood events, uh, uh, childhood adversity uh, and the long-term physical and mental health impacts, which is kind of offers a potential uh, understanding of vulnerabilities uh, and resiliences as well. So in a trauma-informed approach, we assume most people have had some exposure uh, to adversity and potentially trauma. We recognize that it affects all individuals in an organization, uh, including its own workforce. So uh, people who are caring for trauma survivors will themselves likely have had some exposure to adversity as well. And we want to respond to that by fully integrating this knowledge about trauma into the ways that we develop uh, policies, procedures, and also individual clinical practices. Um, and we above all want to resist re-traumatization. So it's this kind of uh, an approach that really thinks about the culture of response. Um, and in the context of the treatment gaps that we have, these astonishing treatment gaps, in, in especially in lower and middle income countries, and even in low resource environments in high income countries, uh, we want to see what else can we do to help change the trajectories after somebody's exposure. So this difference between a trauma-informed and a trauma-focused approach is quite essential. In a trauma-informed approach, we're really thinking about how do we optimize someone's engagement in healthcare? How do we avoid re-triggering them? How do we uh, set uh, uh, some universal precautions in place uh, so that people who, uh, who are coming for treatment or who need treatment, that we sort of lower uh, the barriers for them being able uh, to engage? In a trauma-focused treatment, that's where we're actually addressing the trauma experience, uh, the trauma symptoms, um, and we're focusing on resolution of trauma-related uh, sequelae. Uh, and that may require detailed trauma history um, as part of the treatment. But in a trauma-informed care approach, we sort of frame it with these six principles. Um, the first is safety, and that's not just physical, but psychological. Uh, we want people to feel safe where they are, but we also want them to know when they're coming for treatment that they're not going to be asked, for example, to tell their story all over again. Uh, sometimes that prospect is enough for people to not even want to come in uh, for that first appointment. And so creating a space where we uh, don't ask them to tell the story all over again, where we focus, for example, on their symptoms as they're experiencing them now uh, can be really helpful in engaging people. Trustworthiness and transparency speaks to the fact that also once people have experienced such trauma, uh, this sort of locus of control uh, has gone from inside to outside and it becomes really challenging sometimes to engage in systems where it's not really clear what's happening. You don't know who you're gonna see when you come in. Uh, there's sometimes astonishing bureaucracies that are built up around it. And the more that we can be really clear about what's gonna happen as you come through, what people's roles are in your care, uh, the more that people can, again, feel that sense of overall safety. Um, 
collaboration and mutuality really speaks to this idea that people uh, have a lot of understanding and information about themselves. And we want treatments to sort of uh, come uh, to engage each individual in values that, that they hold as well, and that we'll get there. We may have different priorities as clinicians sometimes going in than uh, the patient will. We want to find middle ground so that we move together. Uh, and we want people to really feel like they have a voice that they can exercise in that process. The last two principles are uh, really um, uh, help us understand the way in which this trauma-informed care approach uh, can support these broader health equity uh, efforts that we are making. Uh, the first is with peer support. Uh, and, and I think Jessica's story is so poignant uh, and, and speaks to this idea that there are uh, supports that you can get from people who have experienced something like you, sometimes around the trauma and sometimes just around other kind of cultural and identity uh, formations that, that can really add to people's healing. So, uh, you know, you don't have to be a therapist to have therapeutic interventions um, and that healing comes from many different places and that's an important complementary one that we want to keep in our treatment plan. And finally, uh, we could start with it or we will end with it, um, the cultural, historical and gender acknowledgement, recognizing that people's culture, their approaches, their gender, all of that influences the ways in which they engage the healthcare system, the ways in which they understand their identity, both before and in the wake of their physical trauma, uh, and that we want to speak to that explicitly rather than kind of ignore it and leave the elephant uh, sitting in the room. So how do we do this? Uh, there are a few approaches that we're going to run through right now uh, to try to optimize this engagement. The first is we call it universal precautions. We want to assume every person has survived some adversity. And so you inquire about the impact of the trauma instead of the trauma itself. In a trauma-informed care approach, we like to say uh, that we focus on uh, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you and how is that impacting your health and engagement? And we wanna sort of create that space for engagement around that set of issues. We wanna remain also very aware of people's role and context, especially when we have team-based care and where there is task shifting. We wanna think about is somebody there in a clinical role or a non-clinical role? Are they there as a treater or are they to support, provide peer support? Um, and, and where along that health system are they? Because the kinds of questions they need, the kind of information that they need to be effective in their role is gonna be quite different. And we don't need to ask people over and over again, for example, for details about their trauma history, for example, uh, that are not gonna help advance that component of their care. The third is something we can call universal framing, really saying what you're gonna do before you do it, what's gonna be done, how are we going to do it and why is it necessary? Uh, the classic example that people talk about often in the hospital is somebody will sort of take off the gown, put on the stethoscope and say, now I'm going to listen to your heart. <laughs> and what we want to do is create a context within which first we say what we're going to do uh, and then we do it. And that's true for any engagement, not just a physical exam, uh, but also a physical exam. And really creating a, a, a context where you say, do you have questions before we get started? Let me know if you want to stop and pause. And these are things that we think are obvious, uh, but maybe when we're well slept and caffeinated and we sort of can do this, but in a hectic or high stress environment can sometimes be overlooked. The fourth is about containment and redirection. If a patient starts diving into details of their trauma and you can see them getting quite distressed. Or if you notice yourself having difficulty maintaining focus because maybe it's triggering something in you, one of the things that you can consider, and this is again, one of dozens of different ways to approach it, is saying something like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I don't want you to have to repeat this history. So if it's okay, let's stay focused on the symptoms you're experiencing now. Let's see what, how we can help you today. Um, and the final one is, uh, we'll have lots of different things. So there were the, the three E's of trauma, uh, there, the, the four R's of trauma-informed care, and here we have uh, the four C's uh, in, in this kind of self-awareness strategy. Uh, the first is to try and, and pay attention to how you're feeling and to take a deep breath and to try to calm yourself so that you're modeling calmness in the person uh, that you're, uh, for the person that you're trying to engage. Uh, the second is 
containing, uh, allowing the person to maintain a sense of safety. And that's where we remember that language is important. Uh, the words that we use, the way we frame things, it's the, you know, what happened to you, not what's wrong with you approach. The third is care and destigmatizing adverse coping behaviors is really important. Um, you know, the, the fact that there will be, there, there may be mental health symptoms, there may be maladaptive use of alcohol and of other drugs. Uh, there may be other kinds of mental health symptoms. We need to just sort of ask in ways that diminish the chance of someone experiencing shame in their reporting, right? So often people will start to drink a little bit when the things get uh, distressing. Sort of in, in whatever culture and in whatever way seems appropriate for your patient and for uh, what's happening in the room to make sure that we sort of present it in ways that are destigmatizing so that people feel comfortable reporting so that we can actually provide good care. I'm always exercising cultural humility uh, in that um, and self-compassion means recognizing that there is, you know, some care that the, the provider, the clinician, the, the caretaker needs to also do uh, after having some of these very intense engagements. And finally, it's to cope, really to sort of think about what are the, the ways in which we make this a trauma-informed approach above all, supporting resilience, really trying to support these positive trajectories, emphasizing co coping skills that people already have uh, that they might be able to access. The social support is, uh, as mentioned before, absolutely essential thinking about ways to connect people and reconnect them uh, to those, to those in, uh, whether it's people already in their lives or to uh, contexts where they can then grow that. Uh, and finally, um, sort of thinking more broadly uh, about psychological first age, Dr. Jaron is uh, gonna talk about a little bit later. I'm just gonna end with, with this image, uh, sort of thinking about the ways in which trauma-informed care and this psychological first aid approach can really be complementary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. That was so uh, informative. I uh, really offering some practical tools as well as understanding. You mentioned a few things uh, regarding um, understanding task shifting and team based approach. And I think that's really key, especially for some of our listeners who have been asking in the in the chat, how do we do this? We haven't been trained in this. Just offering the tools, I think, is really empowering people to feel that they are able to uh, start treating patients from the from the outset, which I think is uh, fantastic. So thank you very much for that. So next we're going to hear from Nadia uh, Raymond. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for the opportunity to be here among peers and share the clinician responder experience. Um, next slide, please. So based on the six guiding principles of a trauma-informed care approach um, and using a trauma lens to our experience, um, it's not often the opportunity is bestowed on someone to contribute to the rescue and recovery, emergency care and global nursing. Global health nursing is a passion of mine. As a critical care nurse, I was prepared. As a nurse leader, I was prepared. However, as a Haitian American clinician responder, I was not prepared. Looking back on my experience, I landed into a country that I belonged to and loved, yet no longer recognized. Growing up, I was sheltered from the reality of the barriers people face daily within a dysfunctional infrastructure. Walking in the Haitian State Hospital, the largest hospital at the time, our team of three assumed responsibility for a ward of 60 patients with minimal to no resources. The clinician colleagues that I was taking over for were broken, sobbing over things left missed or things left undone. I was so grateful for all they have achieved, yet wonder why they could not see it. Safety. As we started, I held my team back for a slight moment and requested to meet with the charge nurse first. Trust. I asked the following questions. What do you need? What is the most pressing thing I can assist with? The biggest need. What is it? She then shared that there was no one on nights to serve the patient. 
and our team of three honored that request and delivered care to 60 patients for a few weeks. Now to peer support. Our team assessed, assisted, implemented new structures, yet we still had a haunting question that plagued us every day. Are we doing enough? Collaboration. We hired three patient family members to act as patient care assistant and out of pocket to assist with daily tasks. We made sure that an 89 year old mother, grandmother, sister, friend died with dignity and not alone. We were the communication bridge for a son and a mother that hid, the mother hid the diagnosis of AIDS for a year because of the stigma that was attached within the culture. We functioned without the technology that we, we were used to and that we needed, but yet did not have. Yet, we still asked, did we do enough? I came back to the US with a sadness, a profound sadness that I had never experienced before. I felt like a stranger I felt like I did, uh, did not honor my nursing code of ethics. Mutuality, we are in this together. I learned to use emotional intelligence to cope, manage my feelings and show up consistent at home and at work. I felt guilty talking about my journey when so many were suffering. I realized very quickly there was no outlet that I was aware of to unpack all these feelings, finding a voice. I did not even know where to begin or what to say to help someone understand the storm that I was experiencing. What I did know is what I wanted to have, a, that I wanted to have a broader impact as a clinician provider, cultural. Fast forward to March, 2020, I was yet deployed again to the COVID ICU as a critical care nurse. It had been almost five years since I was uh, a clinician at the bedside providing direct patient care. Once more, I had my game face on, suppressed every feelings, concerns, or fear. The task at hand was much greater than me. Leaving the COVID ICU once again, I felt the profound sadness. Wait a minute, I can't shake this feeling. Wait a minute, oh, I recognize this feeling. In hindsight, I used the CDC six guiding principle unknowingly to cope in the moment and to support my Haitian colleagues and provide care through COVID. My, my experience during the earthquake was one that not only changed me, but changed the way I saw life and also learned to appreciate who I am and who, how I can contribute, not only to my Haitian colleagues, but to every patient that I encounter. I remember one to two days, I could see nurses coming out of their area to actually chat with us. Believe it or not, the chart nurse had lost everything in the earthquake and was living in the hospital. How do you support that? How do you hold their hands and carry them through their trauma while you're going through your own? And I have to say, again, in hindsight, when I saw the six guiding principle, it was a lit pathway to where I was and to where and now to where I'm going. Thank you. Najee, thank you very much. Um, you really shared your personal experience. I think it's important to hear what a clinician goes through um, and you brought parallels in the Haiti earthquake, your experience there to uh, COVID and how you were able to use the same same skills but you were constantly reminded of, of how it felt and i think it's important that other clinicians listening to this other healthcare providers how you what you described will resonate um with them so thank you for for sharing that in the context very specifically through the um six uh, principles okay so now we're going to hear uh from 
Dr. Jeran Arkaduk, who will speak about the psychological uh, first aid. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for inviting me here today. Please let me share my screen. So uh, I will be talking about psychological first aid and um, as a staff or member of our community, we can find ourselves in an emergency situation with individuals hurt in a traffic accident or a natural disaster. So in helping people in an extremely distressing event, you can support them without causing further harm through psychological first aid. PFA provides a framework to us indicating how to approach a crisis situation safely, safe both for yourself and for others, while respecting people's culture, dignity, and abilities. Depending on many factors, such as the severity of the traumatic event, person's previous mental health problems or age, reactions of people to the event may change. Some people could be confused or some could be overwhelmed. As a response to these reactions, PFA protects people from further harm, assess and provide their needs such as food, water, or information, and help them to feel calm while not pressuring them to talk. So we can think of PFA as a practical care and support. Before describing it more, it is important to emphasize that you don't need to be a professional, a psychologist, or a counselor to provide PFA. Both non-professionals and professionals can provide PFA as a first response. It is not psychological debriefing, right? people provide a detailed information of the traumatic event. In PFA, we don't ask them to put the event in time and order and analyze them. On the contrary, in PFA, we listen to people's stories without pressuring them to tell their feelings, thoughts, or reactions to these events. You can provide PFA to distressed adults or children who have been recently exposed to a serious crisis event. However, people have different reactions to the similar events. So you shouldn't force people to receive PFA, but you can make them aware that you are there and available if they want the support. Also, sometimes people may need more than PFA. They may be at risk to hurt themselves or others. Then it is important to know your limits and ask for more specialized care from your colleagues. One, you can provide PFA at the moment you contact with distressed person who have been recently affected by a crisis event. It could be during or immediately after the crisis. Well, actually a safe enough place is proper for providing PFA. It could be at hospital or as a scene of an accident. Besides safety, to provide privacy is also important, especially for people who expose the event such as sexual violence, it is essential to arrange a private place where you can talk confidentiality and respect their dignity. There are three main principles in PFA, look, listen, and link. But before them, it is important to be prepared about the crisis situation. To be prepared, we need to learn about the crisis event. What happened? When? Where? Available services and support. Who is providing shelter, food, or other related services? How people can reach these services? And you need to check any safety and security concerns. If the event is still continuing, is there any danger in the environment? So when you enter the crisis Iran, take a few moments to look around before you start helping. Through this quick scan, you can get calm and think before you act. If there is no harm for yourself and others, then look for people with urgent needs. If there is someone who can critically injured, refer them to medical personnel. For those who are showing distress reactions, you might provide PFA, uh, but, may, but sometimes some people may have very severe stress reactions and they may need more than PFA alone. And these people shouldn't be left alone, so it is important to find help for them before you leave them. You also need to look for people who may need special attention, such as children, especially those who are unaccompanied, people with health conditions and disabilities, pregnant women, and people at risk of discrimination and violence. To understand the situation and the people's needs, and then to help them feel calm, first you need to listen to them and establish a relationship with them. To really hear their concerns, you should give your full undivided attention in a caring and respectful manner. 
First, you need to approach the person according to their culture. This means if it is more appropriate to women, talk to women in that culture, consider this. Then you introduce yourself by name and organization. And if ask if you can offer help, and if they accept, then you can find a safe place to talk. Ask the person what they would like to be called. You can offer water, or if it is cold, it's something like a blanket to make the person feel comfortable. Then ask about what the person needs and what is their concern at that moment. The person may lost their children during the event or need to call their parents, ask these concerns, and then, if possible, help them about their career needs. While communicating, you can use solar sitting at a comfortable angle, like out stance and distance at a five o'clock position, will actually prevent staring, but still will give a message that I'm here for you. Or And having an open posture with arms and legs uncrossed will show that you are involved and available for the person. To lean slightly in towards the person and listen attentively will also show that I'm listening, but avoid too much leaning in which could be intimidating, or leaning back, which could be conveyed the message that you're not interested at all. Maintain appropriate eye contact. Without staring, you can have a good eye contact and remain relatively relaxed. This will help the others to calm. Ask about the basic needs of, um, and try to meet these needs such as water, food, shelter, for other basic and specific needs, you can link them with the help available in the area. You should give them accurate information about the event and try to uh, keep them updated about the situation and the available services. In trauma, people may lose sense of control, like Dr. Nomi said that the locus of control can change. So it is important to help them reveal it. While giving this information, give simple and clear messages and check whether the person understands or not. Another important part of PFA is to link people with loved ones. Social support, again, as uh, Dr. Soraya said, that social support has been shown to be an important protective factor in crisis times. Help people to contact with loved ones and family members and also encourage them to use positive coping strategies, such as talk with friends or family instead of the negative strategies. But I agree again with Dr. Nomi that it should be destigmatizing the adverse coping events such as uh, drinking too much alcohol. So um, what are the don'ts? So don't ask for any personal gain. Don't give inaccurate information or false hope. Don't force people to talk about the crisis event. Don't judge them or reflect your personal opinions. Don't give reassurances such as, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay. And don't criticize existing services in front of people. Be honest with them. Be aware of your personal judgments and values. Put your values aside and judgments. Respect their privacy. Consider their culture, age, and gender. Try to find a safe and private place to talk. Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Jeran. I'm working with this organization. And use empathic listening. Uh, be patient and calm and provide clear and accurate information. Be honest about the limits of your knowledge and skills. Don't interrupt their story and don't get in physical contact and don't judge their behaviors. And uh, don't also use technical terms, which could be very difficult for people to understand. And don't feel that you are obliged to solve their all problems. As a PFA provider, it is essential that you take care of yourself. Starting from the beginning, ask yourself whether you are ready to provide help. And during the event, check yourself and remember your limits. And if possible, work in a team or with a body and check each other. After the event, it is normal that you feel tired or sad, but if you extremely feel extremely sad and have frequent sad thoughts and memories about the event, uh, speak to a mental health specialist. Thank you very much for listening. That's Arkadok, thank you very much. That's fantastic. You really did equip people with the the do's and don'ts, also establishing that this can be used for peas and adults, which is really uh, important. Uh, and thank you for just displaying it in a way that is attainable, it's accessible for those who are listening. So thank you.
in doing so. So our final uh, talk that we'll have is from uh, Dr. Benjamin Kunu, which is a recording that he is actually uh, with us, which is great, welcome. Um, so I'll allow uh, Joe to now share screen, thank you. Hello everybody. First of all, excuse me for my English. Thank you for the organization of this webinar two days after the World Mental Health Day. Special thanks to Michelle and Eric. I'm Benjamin Puno, a psychologist in Togo, and I will share with you my practice concerning the use of tools or not in the psychological care delivery in Togo. This is the plan of my presentation. After introduction, I will give you two case studies and I will have conclusion. As in introduction, I can say that psychotherapy with validated tools is successful for many mental health patients, but unfortunately, this is not possible for every patient due to many reasons. These reasons are cultural or lack of specialized therapists. For example, in Togo, a country of West Africa, we have for more than 7 million inhabitants, only five psychiatrists and a hundred of clinical psychologists. So in this section, I will share with you two case studies. The first case studies is about the psychological care I've given with tools. And for the second case studies, my intervention without using tool. First case study, it concerns Mr. A. 26 years, he was a refugee in Togo. He asked for a psychological care as his doctor advised him. I received him the first time six months after his arrival in Togo. He had irritability, impulsiveness, difficulty and inability to manage his emotions, insomnia and others. He had also urinary incontinence, a consequence of a torture he suffered in prison in his country. Moreover, with the physical violence and beatings he suffered in prison, he permanently lost the use of his left eye, unfortunately. He came to Togo three months after the torture and physical violence. The doctor gave him medicines. In my practice, I use mainly CBT to give him psychological care. After clinical assessment interviews, I returned PTSD, depression and dissociation with Mr. A. I have used three tools during the psychotherapy interventions as PCLS and BDI in its short version. Assessments were used at three times, at the beginning, during and at the end of my intervention. Cognitive tasks, behavioral approach and hypnosis were used. In this slide, we see that scores were high at the beginning, but they were low at the end of the therapy. I think that the use of tools helped me to give a better intervention. It also helped Mr. A to be more compliant. For example, he respected all the sessions and did all the home tasks I've asked him to do. At the end of the follow-up, 
The main wish of Mr. A is to have a job in Togo or to move Africa for a Western country. This is the end of the first case study. Second case study. It concerns Mr. B. 55 years. He was married and had seven children. He was anxious, had insomnia, constipation, and many somatic complaints. A year before he came for me, he was the, a victim of an arm robbery with an injury and a bullet that will have remained in his right foot. He had revival of this event and pain syndrome in that foot. He went for prayers with pastors during many months without favorable issue. Finally, a doctor advised him to see me. Mr. B did not speak French, so it's difficult to me to use tool to help him. But I use CBT and heart rate variability techniques to give him psychological care. He had 10 sessions. In, form, in fact, the challenge is how to give the best psychological aid to Mr. B with a language barrier. I think that the use of techniques which emphasize somatic approach and a self a self well-being assessment are helpful finally after six months of psychological care he felt better than at the beginning of the follow-up the self well-being assessment moved from three to eight to conclude we can see that the use of tools is useful for psychological care in, of many patients, but in some cultural contexts, it's very difficult to use tools because of language barriers and others. Furthermore, many patients want to see traditional healers, priests, pastors, and others so there is a great delay between the onset of disorders and the first psychological care with a specialist of mental health care. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Benjamin. Uh, so as we're running, so thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. So as we're running a little bit behind time, I'm going to jump right into the questions. So for the audience right now, feel free to uh, put in some questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box and we'll moderate those. And I think we have a couple of questions to start with. One of them is uh, for Soraya Sidad. I think you responded already online, but that would be good if you can uh, share that with, um, with the live audience. Uh, there was one question about how to make sure that oneself has PTSD or not PTSD. Um, so there are uh, screening tools that one can self-administer and uh, one that um, I uh, highly recommend is a five item screening tool. Um, but uh, just to get back to what PTSD is, um, to uh, emphasize that, uh, you know, after traumatic event, it's normal to think, act, and to feel differently than one did before uh, the experience. Um, and so, um, you know, if you start to feel better over a few weeks, then uh, that is a very good sign. But if your symptoms continue uh, for more than a few weeks and they're very upsetting and they are interfering with your day-to-day -day living, uh, then it is important to reach out and to seek help uh, from your primary care practitioner, perhaps to start off with your family doctor. If you have access to a mental health professional such as a therapist or counselor, 
then one should seek out a care for you know further assessment from that individual. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, I think we have another question. A uh, question about uh, therapies and mostly. Uh, so we heard a lot, a lot about different therapies. Uh, so there's a question about how to get trained for those therapies. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, so I see that Soraya, you put in something, but uh, maybe Jalan, you might want to take that one first. Oh yes, of course. Uh, actually for these trainings, uh, there are these um, institutions um, for each different, and treatment, so it's important to receive and um, a training, which is also including not only theoretical one, but also including supervisions. And it is also important to receive uh, it from an accredited, it's difficult for me to pronounce it, but the place that has accreditation from this uh, general, actually, the had uh, for uh, institution of this, uh, like CBT or other uh, psychotherapies in each country, or if it is possible, there are these countries having these um, country branches, and you can receive this first theoretical training and follow it with the supervision, and then you need to take an exam and be, become a certified uh, therapist. Thank you. And Soraya, I think you wanted to say something about So this. on the African continent and in many other low and middle income countries, because of the unaffordability of uh, these trainings, um, many uh, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, other mental health professionals don't receive formal training and accreditation and, you know, certification. Um, and so that, you know, that becomes particularly challenging. There are a number of universities worldwide that offer free web-based trainings. And I put one in the chat box from the Medical University of South Carolina that uh, provides training on psychological first aid and cognitive processing therapy. But as has been mentioned, supervision is particularly important. So clinical psychologists in South Africa typically receive training in cognitive behavior therapy for PTSD and other, you know, mental disorders, prolonged exposure therapy, and um, they're not formally accredited, but they're able to uh, administer these interventions. So it is a challenge. I think, uh, you know, the um, unaffordability of treatment makes it very difficult to reach out to an accredited institute like, you know, the Beck uh, Institute or other <laughs> uh, very kind of eminent organizations that offer these training. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, and I think I, I would really also add that another barrier to training is language. So we're all here, we all speak, or at least understand uh, English, but there's lots of places. Uh, and I mean, even in France, most people wouldn't understand the training in English. So we have other types of barriers. So there's still work to be done here. Uh, I think uh, there might be another uh, question here, a more general question. How, how will you frame, maybe for the for the whole panel, how would you frame the difference or the integration between the trauma-informed care and PFA? Uh, how, how can they relate or yeah, maybe if someone wants to take that one? Um, I can start and then uh, Dr. John, please pop in. So uh, I think there's, there's two parts to this. One is that I think the core uh, actions of psychological first aid align very much with the trauma-informed care. So thinking about safety, thinking about collaboration, thinking about peer support uh, and social supports, thinking about not re-triggering and traumatizing, but really thinking about what are the positive coping mechanisms that we can offer. Um, and sometimes those are material, really like food and drink and, and shelter and safety, uh, thinking about that first. Um, the other piece of it is that we have often thought about going to a medical setting as a place that's safe, but many people don't experience it that way. And so I think another component to understand is that people can have trauma within the medical setting itself and can experience coming into care as traumatic or potentially traumatic. So that psychological first aid, we often think of in the wake of a big disaster, 
but the internal experience of some people coming in for, for their own medical treatment can feel that way. Um, and so there, there's a lot of uh, parallel utility and application of these psychological first aid principles uh, within this trauma-informed approach. Thank you very much. So Michelle, I think we're running out of time. I don't know if there's any last question before we move to closing remarks. Yeah, absolutely. There are some great questions uh, in the chat. Um, I'm not sure whether which one to pick, to be honest, but I think maybe one last question um, from Lael uh, Munguro. So she talks essentially about there not being um, the availability of mental health care specialists, and many of the panelists have alluded to this already. Um, which members of the trauma care team are best to start helping people needing mental care? And I think that's a really important question as I've learned through um, working with you all on this, that it starts from the moment the patient arrives in the emergency room. So I wonder whether who would want to take that? Maybe maybe Nadia as a critical care nurse specialist, this is a good place for you to really uh, jump in and share your wisdom with us. Yes, thank you. In, in um, Michelle, you said it right, is as soon as the patients start when you're giving holistic care is one of the things you have to keep in your privy. Now, with that said, although not every um, frontliner or every provider necessarily is in the mental health piece, but keeping that in mind and keeping yourself informed and updated of, of where your resources are and what are the key things that you can integrate in your practice to help the patient or uh, the colleagues or um, family members in the moment. Um, you know, I, as, I'm, as I listen to our team talk about the different trainings that is oftentimes the best way to go. But when you're looking at an area like Haiti that already lacks resources, where do you ask a colleague in that moment to say, okay, you need to be trained versus having that conversation mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. So that's of both worlds. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's having just the tools to, first of all, say, you don't know, uh, seek out the information, keep yourself informed and integrated in your practice while, you know, in the long term, getting the, the either professional or uh, guidance or education, um, but more importantly, embedding it in your practice in a way just to provide the care that you need in the moment. Thank you, Nadia. So I'm going to hand over to Eric. Thank you all for your questions. Just to say that we will be trying to answer some of those in a in a documentary sum, document summary that we'll provide. But I'll hand over to Eric for last remarks. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Well, so I would like to end by uh, thanking everyone uh, for the wonderful presentation, the panelists, for the willingness to share their personal experience, their expertise with us today. I'd like to thank the audience for um, taking the time to attend this very important topic. Um, we hope that this webinar will be useful to you in your personal, personal lives. Um, in closing, I would like to bring our attention to a couple of three points uh, that may be interesting to think about as we uh, think about the future of our field. The first um, is that most of us, or most of you, uh, were here today to learn about how to manage the mental health impact of experiencing a physical injury. However, as we heard uh, several times today, um, mental health and physical health are closely related. And this is particularly important as there is growing empirical evidence, research evidence that mental health, uh, including traumatic stress, will impact in return physical health. So now we're talk talking or thinking about vicious circle here of uh, mutually reinforcing poor health. So in the future, uh, maybe we could think about more holistic interventions that could target simultaneously both domains of our health, physical and mental, uh, that could help manage the health, health of victims of physical injuries in their entirety, in their globality. And in fact, growing uh, evidence suggests that mind-body approaches like yoga or mindfulness uh, meditation uh, could have efficacy on stress-related conditions such as uh, PTSD. So clearly this is a new direction to prevent the sequelae of traumatic injuries, both mental and physical among patients. 
that could also be a way to promote, we heard about healthcare workers, so that could be also a way to uh, promote resilience about among healthcare workers who care for uh, victims of trauma. And finally, uh, within that point, these mind-body approaches can be delivered by non-healthcare workers, and so supporting, as we discussed, uh, capacity building in low resource areas. This goes to my, uh, and I apologize, I'm a little bit behind, but this goes to my second point and related to the first point. There have been a recent effort to increase capacity by, um, by doing what we call task shifting. That is to say, uh, to delegate tasks, mental health tasks from highly specialized uh, workers, healthcare workers to less specialized healthcare workers or even non-healthcare workers. So for example, there have been studies training teachers to provide psychological support, including within trauma. And so that may also respond to the question of how are we going to find people uh, among our colleagues to care for, for those patients. In fact, there's a ongoing study in, in Europe trying to teach non-healthcare workers to provide minimal interventions to refugees, many of whom have sustained injuries during their migration to Europe. And this ongoing study I just mentioned uh, also includes a, a piece of a um, kind of new technology approach uh, to provide a first step of treatment. And this is actually a perfect segue to my last point. Uh, our other promising approach to consider in the future uh, could be to provide mental health support at the bedside right away as soon as possible using uh, new technology, obviously when available. Uh, and in particular, uh, certain components of the intervention we discussed today have been um, adapted for smartphone delivery, uh, either through a person uh, or through uh, something automatic. That will also be a, a nice way to overcome the language uh, barriers, as we could adapt things, translate things, or even have people remote from other places connect and provide care. And I think that's pretty much it for me. Thank you again uh, all for your attention, for attending. Uh, we do wish you a wonderful rest of your day, night, afternoon, evening, wherever you are uh, today. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you all. Um, please see the bit.ly link and the QR uh, code. Uh, it's also going to be shared in the link uh, in the chat as well. Hey, thank you all for joining. Let's, um, if you could do cameras on just for one moment and we will take a picture of this uh, moment and share it all with you. Thanks, Turner, for sharing uh, the link. Um, yes, Eric, I'm happy to if you have time, time to, I certainly do. Um, Rashi, Carolina, Joe. <laughs> Ready? There you go. Done. Thank you all. Um, so the, the panelists are leaving. I know some of you have appointments. Um, at, uh, shortly, so we'll just allow the panelists, uh, the participants to leave. But those of you, those of you who have to uh, leave the meeting now, uh, the center now, please feel free.
Uh, yes. Um, Eric, I think that's a good idea and I will email you through a link and then we can uh, jump on that. Thank you all. Okay. But yeah, bye-bye.